Sí, pero eso es bueno, por eso que yo digo que esto es más que todo para, ¿sabes? para tener la base de lo que es todo. Pero, pero uno aprende, uno aprende en... Pero si estás ya si a este nivel, debería por lo menos un balance scorecard de, de riesgo es importantísimo. Capaz lo capazito a Chus Bonnet. Capaz lo, lo, lo explica él. No, porque cuando le, le vi la cara cuando se lo dije. Entonces, claro, hice como, ¿ah? ¿Oh? Sí. Sí, eso como no entendí. Sí, es que es verdad que uno, uno aprende en, en, en la calle, pues, en el trabajo, en el Android. Y nunca has trabajado con un, con un, o sea, con un, un development company. Bueno, de, yo he hecho development. ¿Tú has hecho development? Sola, sí, yo he hecho development. Eh, de hecho, he hecho un par de edificios aquí. Este, en North Miami Beach, en North Day Village. Uh, ¿Y qué tal el negocio? ¿Te gusta? O sea, ¿Te gusta lo que es el tibano de estar? ¿Puedo o sea, encargarse de todo? Sí, me gusta. No, no me disgusta. Me gusta más estar del lado financiero, no del lado de... De estar todo, por ahí. O sea, una, una, de que otro, que otro... Estar lidiando con la ciudad, la vaina. Uh -huh. Buen provecho. que cuando inviertes en algo que está operativo es una cosa cuando inviertes en un nivel el riesgo es gigantesco por claro porque me imagino que no, no sea es mi, por ejemplo yo no invierto en nada que no tenga permiso yo no invierto que en ya el... se hayan ejecutado todos los permisos bueno. sí yo no invierto en el sueño del developer claro yo invierto en algo que tenga permiso claro yo, el tiempo que te puedes pasar en permisología y en el sueño del developer ese tiempo yo no me lo puedo, yo no, yo no, lo puedo perder, claro. no me lo puedo, no, ni de casualidad. Claro. O sea, yo no invierto en lo que llaman Greenfield o en Brownfield, porque es realmente es Brownfield. Yo invierto, que es algo que ya está más o menos avanzado, pues. Que está más o menos avanzado, si sí o no, porque no me da tiempo. Okay. En la vida de una inversión. Y porque el riesgo entonces es mucho más alto. Entonces cuando yo hago un balance score card, digo, mira, yo para meterme en este riesgo, si le dan los permisos, si es histórico, si entonces se encuentra bajo una ruina, Claro, te, ya estás ahí, sí, te metes. Ya ahí. me tendría que dar un retorno del 45%, por supuesto, y no me lo vas a dar. Lo, más o menos como cada, los retornos de esos de developments, se, o sea, más o menos cuánto es, o sea, un 30%, más o menos. Más o menos. Más o menos. ¿Tú manejas una cartera, por ejemplo, de, 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 una cartera de, de gente o manejas una cartera personal? No, manejo gente, instituciones, este, y nosotros personalmente. Okay. Somos, tengo diferentes fondos en diferentes países y tengo un master fund. Y el, tengo una parte que es institucional, tengo a ING, tengo a Scotiabank, el mismo, hasta el gobierno colombiano en mi inversión. Y después tengo family offices en otras carteras, en otro tipo de fondos. ¿Hay dirección en forces. Bueno, si te importa un día que yo pueda pasar a, vis a ver y a visitar, a mí también me interesa mucho. Y, y o sea, mi familia más que todo está más que todo en bolsa y en bonos, en cosas así. Bueno, ¿Cuál es tu apellido? Eh, Maroso, Marque. 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 Sí. Entonces, eh, y yo ahorita que estoy creciendo, yo, de mi, de mi familia, de parte de madre, soy el único, el único hombre. ¿Cuál es el nombre de los Marques? Capaz conoces a mi tío, Sixto. Sixto Marque. ¿Al tigre? Ese es mi abuelo. ¿Ese es tu abuelo? Ese es mi abuelo. Bueno, mi, tío es... mi mamá es la mejor amiga de. ¿Cómo se llama? La hermana. Eh, de la hermana de la hermana que de mi abuelo. Sí. Eh, no sé qué duda ya te digo. Eh, mamá casi sabe que se o sea, Y la hija de él oh está casada con René Brillenburg. Ah, Paula. 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 Paula es mi tía. ¿Esa es tu tía? Es mi tía. Yo soy socia de David. De David, el hermano. Ok, mm -hmm. ok. Ya. Está casado con Pamela Pineda. Ya, 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 claro. Ajá. Sí, sí, claro, David. Sí, el hermano de, de, de René. Ajá. Sí, claro, es mi tía. Pablo. Bueno, entonces, sí, 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 ¿me entiendes? Eso me interesa a mí mucho porque yo quisiera diversificar un pero ya más me gusta más lo que es el río, sí, lo que es sí, levantar un edificio. Y me parece que es un negocio bueno, pues me parece que hay buenos retornos. Si lo hace bien. Entonces me interesa ir a ver, a ver cómo trabaja todo, porque ¿verdad? yo sé que esto es, como te digo. René hace también cosas. Sí, sí, sí trabaja, pero no, con José Ramón, ¿sabes quién es José Ramón? Con el, el, nosotros trabajamos también mucho con él, pero, pero bueno, algo diferente, ¿me entiendes? No puedo creer que se me olvidó, pero el nombre, 
Se lo ve la hermana mía, mi mamá. Este. Que es la hermana de, de, de tu abuelo. De mi abuela. De tu abuelo. De mi abuelo. Ajá. Si María Teresa. María Teresa. Ah, María Teresa, pues. Que yo me sé muy bien el nombre de Yo conozco la, la parte de mi abuela mejor. ¿no? Mi abuelo, yo no sé si sabe, pero yo Alzheimer. Uh -huh. Hace que, ya casi 12 años. Uh -huh. Sí, porque yo era muy chavito, pues. Uh -huh. Pero, sí, seguro sí, seguro sí. Le digo a mi mamá, pues, me dice. Qué pequeño es el mundo, ¿verdad? ¿Quién conociste? Una es Milinki. Es Milinki. Es Milinki. Es Milinki. Es Milinki. Ok, es Milinki. Es Milinki mi apellido. Ok, lo voy a decir. Lo voy a decir. ¿Cómo te llamas tú? Disculpa. Irene. 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 Bueno, yo tengo ahí tu contacto. Tamayo es mi marido. Lo que pasa es que mi apellido era medio complicado, entonces agarré mi esposo. Me casé muy jovencita, entonces. Ok. En Venezuela es Irene de Tamayo. Ok. Pero cuando llegué aquí me pusieron Irene de Tamayo. ¿Y toda tu familia está aquí? O sea, tu esposo. Mi esposo sí, mi esposo me sigue así. Tus hijos tienen son estudiantes aquí. Están ahorita en Miami. Okay. Ese no es el nombre de mi marido. ¿Qué pequeño es el mundo? ¿Qué pequeño es el mundo? How small is the world? We almost ended up being family. Sí. Sure, yeah. <laughs> How small is the world that we almost ended up being family? <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry this thing is so badly marked. Don't up. worry, don't worry. Don't um, worry. Uh, you, you expect any? Oh, thank you very much. I was going to ask for I a few more things. I really don't know what I'm expecting. What happened was the first time I ordered the book, the shipper, it made an error. And when he posted it, he sent me an email. He said, you know, this book was already sold out. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. So I had to reorder it. And now, like I told you, they gave me the spam from like, the first of the fourth to the seventh. Yeah, that's kind of usually get more real target days. So, I mean, hopefully I'll get it this week. I'm, 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 I think I will. I certainly don't need that back for a while, so you so take your time with it. I'll read, I'll read for sure. I'll start reading chapters one through six, or chapters one through five, which one, oh, okay. the one that I missed. Yeah, and, 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 and the ch I know the chapters are the same. For the same as the seventh? Because I got the seventh also. I did, this is the sixth, right? Got the what, I'm sorry? I got the seventh edition, I think. Is this yeah, but I gave you the sixth. Right? Yeah, no, the it's seventh the is what's coming. Yeah, they're going to be, those are identical. Okay. Yeah, there is, that, there is no difference between those. Okay. Um, that I can discern. There's one little thing, something, some little buzzword they added at the beginning about these are the words we want you to learn or okay. something. I mean, but it, in other words, it's it's, okay. it, it is definitely the same stuff. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Don't be silly. My pleasure. I'm glad if you have it. Just sitting around. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
You get to the point. That's the good thing. Thank you. I just, I just want something. You know, give me something. Give me something. Nice. I don't know. Are you grabbing it super yourself? She's a bad I think it's huge. Plus, yeah, let's, let's, let's do the bend test. Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> That's, that's what they. But that's I heard people were going. Supposedly, out of everybody, was nine people who, who came to the event. Yeah, the main. Like, you have to. Right. You have to put like a lot of force, or you have to right. this, this wear skinny <laughs> jeans, where you know, this tight. So I don't think it's gonna bend. Overall, it's, 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 it's big. It's too my bad. question to you really, really is, nah, man. It's all you got big one. I love it. <laughs> my question to you really is, is You're the phone different? You got the old one. Besides the size, yeah, is the phone different? I mean, man, look, you can do this. Just just kind of give me something new. What's new about this? But that's what you can you do. You got to do? Ask me one. Yeah. Why would I buy this? I want to see it. You want to see it? I don't like bigger. It looks neat, though. I can eat this, man. Give me something new. Give me a new feature. It's just stupid, but I like it. You can do this. Which? Oh, you can go. You got your messages here, and then you got the actual conversation. And that, that's all what we do with Galaxy uh, already, though. <laughs> you see the things that they, they get new? It's stuff that we've been doing for years. Yeah, it's a little scary. <laughs> well, the, next, it's, the next it's big huge. thing is already here? Yeah. It's already here, man. <laughs> Galaxy. The Galaxy, you do that? <laughs> yeah, we do that. <laughs> no, you know they say that it has the same features. Can you that certain things? No, I, I don't know. <laughs> man, you guys are messing up. Juan, yours is skinnier and longer than mine. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I, I was I was about to change it for the six for that for the normal one because I thought it was too big. Nah, man. You need a case for that thing, though. I had a case, but it just made it. Don't huge. let anybody tell you differently. Size matters. Oh lord. <laughs> but no, man, it's the same thing as that. It's the same thing as a, as a five. It, it it's just a, really a slimmer phone, you know. It supposedly has a faster oh, nice. processor. Yeah, and blah blah blah. blah but, you know. But easy. That's I like how he words that supposedly. Because they're all, they're all fast, you know. That's how I tell the guy. Man, these things are so fast now. Oh, yeah. Can you get one? What? <laughs> I don't care until oh, all my apps seven. start to slow down. Yeah. Ready for the iPhone 7? Okay. The next big thing. <laughs> Super big. Thanks. The Nexus 6 is supposed to be out there. Is the, uh, the, watch, the watch out yet? No, it's in February. The Nexus 6? Or the watch? No, no, no. You know, there's this company that has a really great technology that they use the, the um, Apple um, and Samsung, where you go to the bank and they, they can scan your image rather than putting in your pin and has something that um, they're using like a QR code from the bank, from the bank. And so it'll just know, okay, that's you, or give you access to your account rather than you taking out your debit card and using the user. You know what, it's gonna be nice to Apple Pay. Yeah. But this Apple takes it even further than that. Yeah. You, now you don't even have to do that. They just take up a picture. It kind of goes along with that. Technology. With Apple. If they, if like Apple gets, if it actually gets everybody to start using that, right? Yeah. That's gonna be a huge stream of revenue. Yeah. Bro, I 
job yet. Okay. Yeah, it's where you just like sit your phone down the Yeah, you just go like this, yeah, and, yeah. and obviously you get like a percentage of what happens. What happens if I steal your phone? Though? I know, man. No, <laughs> before you do this, no, look, yeah, you gotta. She has like a scan red thing. What's it called? Phone. Apple Watch. Let's get started, folks. Right. Apple Pay. Thank you. Um, this little bio thing I got. I'm missing four. For whoever didn't jump in, I'd be grateful if you could do it for me by the end of class. If you have that information for me about where you went to school and stuff like that. Thank you, thank you to those who didn't. And if you can't find it, there are a couple more forms up here. Uh, chapter three. Uh, I'm sorry, anybody have any questions you want to do before we start? Anything we covered? Okay, we're still going to shoot for 4.30. Thank you for the quickie lunch. Um, chapter 3 is about um, water, mineral, and air rights in connection with land. Um, they're all real estate principles. Um, they all affect what you can or can't do with your property. Um, we've talked about that uh, real estate means land and all its improvements, but it also means water, air, minerals, etc. Um, the book described an inverted pyramid, and that's a good one. Um, and if your parcel of land is here, the inverted pyramid down to the center of the earth, all the way up into the skies. You got air rights, you got underground rights, you got your piece of surface land right here. And all that stuff's real estate. So the first one we're going to talk about is water rights. There are basically two kinds of water. There's surface water and underground water. Surface water is what we're going to deal with mostly because it's pretty hard to locate and figure out the underground water. But it has some relevance. But surface water, um, pretty obvious where that is and what that is. Um, lands that front on the water waterfront, that's where the term comes from obviously, um, are called riparian lands. Riparian, riparian, pronounced both ways. Riparian <coughs> lands have riparian rights. Riparian rights is the concept that we're going to talk about because it's the rights of a riparian landowner to make use of water. Um, Traditionally, riparian means lands that are on a stream, a river, something moving. Um, there's another term, and they've kind of become interchangeable, and I use them interchangeably, and most people I know do, and it's called littoral lands. Littoral, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. And theoretically, littoral lands are the ones that border on an ocean, on a lake. And when the distinction is made, usually talk, people talk of littoral as uh, maybe saltwater rights versus riparian freshwater rights. But let me tell you that everybody that I know uses them interchangeably. Either term means waterfront land. Uh, littoral rights are the same as riparian rights. White rights of the waterfront owner to make use of the water. Um, know if you would that Florida, the state of Florida, owns the land under all the water. Everywhere. Under your canals, under your lakes, under your rivers, State of Florida. And I can 
sell it. Um, if your land totally surrounds a lake, it's a little different. But um, basically, Florida claims title to all submerged lands under navigable waters, and that means any water on which you could navigate a craft. Not necessarily interconnected. Uh, lake Okeechobee is a bad example. A lake lock, a landlocked big lake like Lake Jackson in Tallahassee, that's navigable water even though it doesn't have a canal that connects it to the Gulf. State claims the ownership of the land underneath the lakes, underneath the water. So that's who your neighbor is, is a state, if you own waterfront property. Um, there are a couple of groups of theories of water rights. Um, most of, uh, to, to surface water, we're still talking about. Uh, most of them are called the riparianism states, that's a mouthful, riparian with an ISM, riparianism. And those are the eastern states, and those include Florida to a limited extent that we'll talk about in a minute. And what those states believe and hold and uh, allocate to the waterfront owner is a right to share the water equally with everybody else. No one has any preferential right or claim. Um, there's a couple things in here that you're not responsible for in the book, the natural flow doctrine and the reasonable use doctrine, and, 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 and. Um, it's all real complicated stuff, and it's, it, it's not very often applicable. Um, we'll come back to Florida in a minute, but let me give you the other group of rights. The western states all hold to a theory called prior appropriation. <coughs> That says that the person that gets to use all the water is the one who started using it first. Meaning, first guy who had the waterfront house, he can suck all the water out of the lake if he wants to, it's too bad for everybody else. First guy there, first claim, first dibs. <coughs> it's pretty absurd, but it's still the law in the western states. Now that's not Florida. Florida's in the first group of states that says let's all share the water equally. And Florida has what's described by everybody as a modified riparianism plan. And what that's about is that the state has gotten involved in regulating water. Um, we have water management districts throughout the state of Florida. We have the South Florida Water Management District here. And these are state agencies whose job it is to regulate water and water flow within the boundaries of their district. Ours, of course, is the South Florida Water Management District. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection is also involved. And Florida has a whole statute, you don't have to know this, chapter, five, chapter 373 called the Florida Water Resources Act of 1972. It sets up all this, this structure in Florida. And this is not just canals, this is rivers, this is, this is drainage ditches, this is waters along the roads, um, everywhere. Um, the states that, that uh, including Florida, <coughs> Um, often have permits for water. A lot of states issue permits to use the water. Florida does too. Florida's is called a consumptive use permit. Consumptive use permit, they're called CUPs. Uh, they're permits issued by your water management district. And they expire. They have to be renewed. They're issued for different terms, but never indefinitely. These are the kind of permits like sugar cane growers get to drain the water to flood their crops, um, to drain the water for irrigation, 
um, for golf courses and stuff. I mean, all of the um, all of the uses that a waterfront owner could make, not to take a boat out on his water, but I mean to make use of the water itself, um, is um, is regulated by the water management district. Is that only uh, commercial uses, or I'm sorry. Is that only commercial use? Consumptive uses. <coughs> what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Consumptive uses. Uses. The, the permits are to consume the water, to use it. Uh, other purpose, other use like can I build a dock and stuff like that? That's regulated by normally your building departments, except to the extent that you get out over land, over underwater land owned by Florida, and then often you have to get a permit from the state. Um, now, Florida regulates water in one other way, and you're all familiar with this, and this is when we have a drought. And they say when you can water your lawn, when you can wash your car. Uh, this is a method of water regulation. That's usually more water that you bought from the city, um, but it is fall under the big umbrella of water usage regulation within Florida. Um, on salt water, I want to mention one concept that's important to know because obviously salt water frontage is important to us here. And this really only applies to beach frontage, but it also applies to frontage on salt water without a seawall. What we're talking about is a sloping bank of any type. Sloping bank of a beach, sloping bank of a salt water um, Canal without a seawall that has tides. The water rises and falls. The important concept here is if you are the waterfront owner, you only own the land to the high water mark. That's established by surveyors, but over time, historically, with the, the height of the tides, and of course, we have you know, spring tides and fall tides when it's higher, tides are higher. And theoretically, as the tides get higher and higher, and to the extent we have global warming and water are going to get higher and higher and higher, what's happening is the high water mark is higher. And if you are the waterfront owner, you own less land. Because Florida then owns the land below the high water mark. So at low tide, the distance between the high water mark and the low water mark, that's owned by Florida. <coughs> and of course, continuing, Florida then owns the land under the water anyway. And in an oceanfront situation, that it applies all the way out, obviously, until the federal government takes over, which is traditionally the three mile limit, but there's a 12 mile limit, and there are different rights of the feds in the state and those districts. But I mean, basically, if you're the waterfront owner, your neighbor is the state at, at some level. Yes, sir. So that constitute a taking by the state if the sea level rises? I wish you luck with that one. <laughs> I guess. No. 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 no? no. I mean, you mean such that, that you, uh, follow me through on that, that you would be able to sue the state because water's getting higher and I'm losing my land here. So the state of Florida, you should pay me for that? It's a regulatory well, taking. So what you're saying? They're taking my land. Who, who took your land? The state of Florida. They didn't do anything to take it. The tides took your land. Exactly. <laughs> the moon moves around, you, you know. And the state's yeah, taking your land right now a lot more than it took this summer because the tides are hard. That's going to go back. Um, I, 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 my answer would be no. I don't, I don't think you'd get very far with that. So like in Tallahassee, that, that big lake that drained. In Tallahassee, um, that what? That big lake that drained for that no was, reason. That was Lake Jackson. That Lake Jackson. Yeah, went, went totally dry. It went totally dry. State land. Tons of, I mean, I don't know how big that lake is, but it's huge. Oh, the monster, yeah. That's all now state land? Yeah, that was state land, is, and it's filled back up, to my understanding. Okay. Um, but, yeah, that's all state land. Let me give you an example of something different, though, that, that, that is weird. Um, anybody boaters? A little bit. Okay. Um, there are different places along the intercoastal where people hold title to shallow areas mm -hmm. under the intercoastal. 
Um, there's one very close to Port Everglades that is uh, what people call a sandbar. Everybody anchors out. Everybody gets in the water at low tide and runs right. around. Um, mm -hmm. There are huge ones in Dade County all over Biscayne Bay, but right, we have right, a few right, small right. ones here in Broward. But I know of three places in Fort Lauderdale where people actually hold title to the land under the intercoastal waterway. They pay taxes on it, and they can't do a whole lot with it, but they keep trying. Um, one in particular um, is a sandbar in the middle of a bay on the intercoastal directly across from Bridge State Park. Um, there's a Cory Yacht Club and there's a bay immediately north of the Cory Yacht Club and the center of that bay has a sandbar. Uh, there's a guy that has held title to that land and I say held title to that land. Got a deed from the state of Florida. That's how you get title to state lands. State of Florida deeds them to you. And not, real, and not gonna happen today, but long, long ago, people received deeds, thank you very much, to, um, to Bay Bottom, we call it, to land underneath water. That guy who has the title to the land in the middle of that bay across from Birch State Park would love to develop it. He'd like to fill it, seawall it, put a couple, a couple of big condos up there, um, all the homes along Seminole Drive that face that bay that have beautiful waterfront view over State Park and Intercoastal, they're not real big on this. Mm -hmm. And the guy also happens to own the only vacant lot on that street. And he'd like that to be a road and he'd like to put a bridge out there to his island. And every year, files an application with the city for approval and with the state. And every year they turn him down. But he keeps paying taxes on it thinking someday maybe I can pull this off. There's another one near Bahiamar. Uh, there's actually two near Bahiamar, the one we talked about near Port Everglades, and then there's one on the other side of the Harbor Ridge Island. And these are many, many years ago, um, properties deeded by the state to old Florida families. Um, and, and some of these used to be above land, I mean above water. They were, mm -hmm. had mangrove islands on them and they were, and they slowly eroded Back in the old days, the state needed them out. And uh, so um, the point is, that's who the owner is. And you maybe in the old days got a deed to some piece of underwater bottom. That'll never happen today. How do they assess that? I'm sorry? How do they assess underwater land like that? It's a good question. I don't know. It's certainly not very usable. Um, the guy who owns the one closest to, oh, I'll tell you who it is. You've heard of the Brian Holmes restaurant? downtown right here on the riverfront, the Bryan homes. The Bryan family was one of the old original Fort Lauderdale families with the trading post and the big old house, the Bryan home on the intercoastal, uh, on the New River. Um, Reed Bryan is a local lawyer, um, been around forever, and his family had, and he now has, the title to that piece. It's, um, <coughs> It's south of the Los Olas Islands, but head south. It's east of the Rio Vista Isles. It's near the, the Lauderdale Yacht Club, and it's a triangle. The, the, intercoastal, the intercoastal does this, mm -hmm. and also does this. There are two channels of the intercoastal, mm -hmm. and there's a triangle in there, and Reed Bryan owns that. And that's where everybody on the weekends, low tide, anchors out, kids get out, run around the flat, everybody parties, and and at sundown, everybody beats it. Um, Reed is trying to get the county to buy that from him. And saying, why don't you buy this from me and make it a park? And then all the public can use it. Now, can you imagine the reaction of everybody who lives around here on all these $20 million houses that live around this thing saying, what? You want to put a park out there? You got to put a bridge to it? You know, what do you, you know? So, uh, it, it can be harder to develop these things, but it certainly is, I, I'm, to answer your question, I think they're taxed very low. I don't think anybody would continue paying the taxes on these if they were paying for much. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and so they keep paying them and keep hoping. And everybody keeps thinking maybe someday my grandchildren are going to do something with this, you know? Yeah. So if someone gets hurt out there, he's liable? I'm sorry? If somebody gets hurt on the sandbar over the weekend, he's liable? That's a good question. Plenty of people get hurt, certainly like the guy in Miami. Um, they probably didn't even know that. Yeah. That's private property. Um, yeah, I. Uh, that's, that's a good question. 
No. Uh, maybe he buys insurance. I oh, doubt it very so seriously. Okay, now I know. He hasn't made any improvements. He didn't, you know, there, there was a concept we're going to talk about a little later about your, your duty to strangers, even criminal strangers. Um, but I think that would be a stretch. I'd want to be on the side of that one, not, not the person I got hurt. Um, okay. Um, and we've got underground water, subterranean water. And what that means is water that has percolated through the ground into the underground. There's also a whole section in the book called Underground Streams. We don't really have much of that in Florida underground. We don't have that much flowing underground water. We have plenty of underground water. You know, people put wells down and suck water up for sprinklers, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but we don't have underground rivers that I'm aware of. And in the states where they do, it's hard to prove. And the law is different as to underground streams, so we're going to kind of ignore that. What we've got is simply subterranean water, and that is percolating waters that have traveled through the surface of the earth and have gathered underground. And there are different rules for how you can use it. The one that's important is called the reasonable use rule for using that underground water. And in Florida, they follow the reasonable use rule what that says is you may use the amount of water necessary to service your land. Not to service somebody else's land, not to suck it up out of the ground and sell it, but such reasonable use of the water that's under you for the benefit of your parcel. And in Florida, you don't need a permit for that. You just do it. Like putting a well down for sprinklers. You just do it. You may need a building permit, but you don't need a water permit for that. Now, that's it for water rates. Um, not a big issue in Florida. Not a lot of litigation on it. It's going to become a huge issue in the future for all of us as we start running out of water. But for now in Florida, it's not a big issue. Um, mineral rights. Next thing. Land has water rights and land has mineral rights. Similarly, this is not a big issue in Florida, but I think you need to understand it. The concept that if you own the land, you own the right to extract the minerals that are in that land. Now, it could mean gold, but it usually means it's coal, or, uh, or um, and what's important about it is that these mineral rights, which the surface owner owns, can be separated from the land. You can own the land and sell the mineral rights to somebody else. That other person owns the mineral land, mineral rights, but not the land. There are four ways to do that. They're outlined in your text. I don't want to go through them and tell you which ones are, are important to know and that we use and which there are. First thing is pretty obvious, a mineral deed. I own the land, and I'm deeding to you the ownership of all of the minerals that are on my land or under my land. Remember, we're talking about digging down, mining, excavating, going down deep, theoretically to the center of the earth. Um, all those minerals you can sell and still own the land. That's the most common way. And, and then, those mineral rights can be transferred to person to person to person. Once you've separated the mineral rights from your land and sold them, whoever you sold them to can sell them to B and to C and to D, and they sell them, transfer them, 
broke on whatever. Not a biggie here in Florida, but it, it, it happens. The other way to do it is to reserve the minerals when you sell the land. It's called a mineral reservation. When I sell you my land, but I'm reserving the minerals, I'm keeping them. You end up with the same situation. One guy owns the surface land, another guy owns the minerals. But you get there two different ways. The same concept. Somebody separated the minerals from the ownership of the land. And in each case, they can each then be sold separately. Land keeps moving, minerals keep moving. Maybe they end up back together, maybe they don't. Um, mineral reservations occur in Florida largely in connection with lands that were formerly owned by the state of Florida. Rarely in any other way. It used to be that when, without getting a length into the history of land titles, um, Florida owned all the land, of course, at one time. Um, and in order to acquire title to any piece of land, the state has to have deeded it at one point. You know, the U.S. got Florida from the treaty with Spain, and the U.S. owned all of Florida. In the U.S., then Florida was formed, the state of Florida is formed, the U.S. transfers all the land in Florida to Florida, and Florida owns all the land. Every piece of land that you see developed anywhere, here, there, everywhere, at some point, the state of Florida has deeded that land to somebody. 100 years ago, 150 years ago, I don't know when Florida was formed, way back. And if Florida hasn't deeded that land, well, then number one, they still own it. But number two, when they do own land, when Florida deeds land to you, Florida reserves the mineral rights. State of Florida says, I'll be glad to save the land, but if there's ever any minerals discovered there, Florida owns it. Now, over the years, one by one, Florida has started releasing those mineral rights. They were a real problem in the old days, and they're still a problem, if they're coupled with what's known as the right of exploration. If you own the mineral rights in my land. I don't really care. Because I'm never going to go dig up any minerals. So, so what? But if you have the right to come back onto the land and explore for it, then I got a real problem. You start digging, tearing up my land, looking for minerals. So, a mineral rights coupled with the right of exploration is a real issue. Florida long ago said, okay, we give up the right of exploration. We, the state, will not come into your land and dig holes looking for gold. But if you ever find it, thank you, we own it. <laughs> and then they, went, then they started saying, okay, we own a quarter of the mineral. So they figured out pretty quickly, well, if we reserve all the minerals, why the hell should the guy dig it up and find it for us anyway? Uh, so let's start reserving a quarter of the mineral. Maybe the guy will dig for gold and we'll get a quarter of it. The important thing is Florida has begun to release those rights. And in any parcel that you're going to deal with in a residential subdivision or something, those long, long ago have been released. But you start dealing with land out agricultural areas, and Florida may very well have the mineral rights. If it's coupled with the right of exploration, that's an issue. It, it technically should bother you. Um, okay. Now, there are two other things you can do with minerals. This is definitely not going to happen in Florida, but I'm going to tell you about them in there in the text. There's a mineral lease. You can say, um, I'll give you the right to look for minerals on my property. And my rent under the lease is royalties. I want a certain percentage of whatever you find. 
And that's, of course, what we just talked about with Florida, retaining a quarter of the minerals. But under a lease, I'm leasing you the land. I'm not selling you the land. I'm leasing you my land solely for the purpose for you to go look for minerals, and if you find any, give me some. That's a mineral lease. And the last thing is a mineral rights option. And that is, I'll give you the right to explore on my land and look for minerals, but you don't have the right to dig it up. So how do you explore? And under the mineral rights option, it says that you then have the option to negotiate with me the right to buy them or the right to lease them. And usually the option price is set in the document. So the point is, I'll go look, I'll go look for them because I know that I have the right to buy the minerals for a certain price or I have the right to, um, under royalties, extract them. Otherwise, there would be no reason for me to go find them for you, of course. Um, and under those deals, you don't have any mineral rights immediately, but you have the right to get mineral rights if you find some. This stuff is pretty obtuse, but it's important to understand that most importantly, land has mineral rights, and those mineral rights can be separated from the rights of the surface owner. That's what counts. So you say Florida does not have, um, you do like mineral lease? Say again, sir? You said Florida does not do have like mineral lease? Well, I just think, it's, from what I understand, it's not sophisticated enough a business in Florida. There's not enough minerals around. Now, maybe I'm missing something I haven't heard about. Certainly, there are quarries. <laughs> around the state, but usually in quarries what they're doing is taking out rock and taking out fill. Mm -hmm. But that's not really thought of as minerals. And uh, um, in my experience, I've never seen a mineral lease or a mineral rights option before. That doesn't mean they don't exist. There's just not much of this going on. Well, this you know, be like West Virginia or, you know, a coal. Well, this would be something like oil companies would use, do a lot with, um, you know, if they, they know there's, there's oil on, on, on land say up north, um, they can lease the land and then dig for the rights, dig for the, well, the oil. Let me say to you that the whole next section is called oil and gas rights. And theoretically we were going to talk about that, but I crossed it out and said it just doesn't happen. Um, in my experience, particularly in South Florida, nobody's drilling for oil and gas and there is there's no lawyer that I know of that knows anything about this stuff because it just doesn't happen. So uh, to answer your question as to oil, I honestly don't know. And um, there is a whole body of law on oil and gas rights. I mean, and if you can imagine in Texas and Oklahoma, and they have all these theories of who owns it because this guy's got a well over here and he's yeah. sucking it from under this guy's property. And I mean, it's it's ugly and nasty and litigious. And, um, and it's just a whole body of law that I thought, I don't want you to have to learn it. I didn't want to have to learn it to teach it to you um, because it just ain't going to happen, I don't think. So um, that's all I have on mineral rights, and I'm skipping the section on oil and gas rights just because I think it's irrelevant. But the next section I think is very important, and I think this is the future. It's air rights. Air rights are big. And it's not necessarily what it sounds like. Traditionally, air rights is, of course, the right to use the airspace above your land. As somebody said, all the way up into the heavens from a reasonable manner. Well, that was cool until they invented airplanes. And Clearly, if you own land, people are going to fly an airplane over it. And there's the issue of, you know, did you use my air rights? You have to pay me for flying over my land? Well, that, that got disposed of pretty quickly. The courts have handled that just fine. The answer is no. Um, now, it has to be reasonable. Um, if a crop duster flies low over my land and the noise scares my cattle, it's not my crop duster, then maybe I've got the right to bitch about it. You know, maybe you did invade my airspace. Uh, but largely, aviation has just been carved out as an exception. Sure, you own the airspace, except aviation trumps that. 
and we're just not going to hear about it, as far as the course is concerned. Um, the reason it's important is, and it's hard to even conceive that this is air rights, but people build buildings over your land, in your airspace, not even necessarily on the ground. Um, I-75, I-85 I through downtown Atlanta. Anybody's driven that? You drive under all kinds of buildings. Big, fancy apartment buildings, office buildings, glass, shopping centers. Those buildings are all built over the interstate. Those buildings are built in airspace purchased from whoever owns the land under the roof. State of Georgia. We got a biggie right here in town. Beach Place. Beach Place on the beach here in Fort Lauderdale. Three stories of bars and restaurants and shops. Big parking garage out back. The owner, developer of that built his shopping center and his uh, and his parking garage. And he sold the airspace to Marriott Hotels who built this monster Marriott Hotel. They don't own any of that land. And what they get, and this is important, they get, they also negotiate an easement. They've got to sit on pilings or something. When, when a building's going to sit up in the air, got to touch the ground at some point. And those pilings or supports or whatever have to go down to the ground somewhere. Probably on the same land that they bought the airspace from. Probably on this parcel. If I bought the airspace over this parcel. I need to negotiate the right to have the pilings going down to support my building. But my building is sitting up here in the airspace. Maybe, maybe 30, 40 feet up on pilings. But the road's going underneath, the railroad's going underneath. But the building is built in the airspace. And we're going to run out of land someday. And this is exactly what's going to happen. All kinds of places. I mean, we have redevelopment where you knock down what was there and build something else. But we also have something that's sitting there that we need to keep, a railroad, but then you an also have, I'm sorry? Sorry, I was saying you also have transfer of development rights as well. You mean separate from property? Yes, that's a concept that we'll get into when we talk about uh, land regulation by, by governmental bodies. Um, but right now I'm just talking about the different rights of property owner and the right to the air above your property and, like mineral rights, you can sell the airspace. You can lease the airspace. And it could very well be, in a situation like this, that the building is big enough that it's over several persons. And the easements for support could theoretically be out here in pilings. But you've got to buy this guy's airspace in order to be entitled to occupy the airspace. Um, it goes further, and the text talks about I guess this is related. Um, the right to sunlight. Um, that's your airspace. If somebody blocks your airspace, they block your sunlight. And there's litigation over stuff like that. What if you build something that puts me in the shade? Um, any event, this is going to be a biggie in the future. And it's going to, it's all over New York and Chicago right now. The reason I mentioned the Atlanta one is just because I figured everybody had driven through that interstate. You got to go. You go right under these buildings. You just like wow, there's a building right in the, from a distance. It looks like you're driving right into a building. And uh, theoretically, we got the same thing down here with the tunnel. The new tunnel that is the extension of the airport's south runway, going right up over. Now, I don't know who owns the US one right away, um, and who owns the runway. But I mean, the, we got the same concept there. Right. And the air rights over the US-1 is now an airplane runway going right over top. Um, OK. Now there's, there's one more section of stuff um, at the end of this chapter. And I'm not sure why it's here, but they are important concepts. 
Um, they're called common law limitations on land use. And there are three important concepts I want to talk about. Um, they're not your rights of the landowner, but they affect rights of the landowner. And that's the reason they threw them in here, because I don't think they had another chapter for it. The first one is nuisance. There's a huge area of the law called nuisance. And nuisance is technically defined as an unreasonable interference by one party, the landowner, with another's use or enjoyment of his land. What that means simply is, in this, in this context, you use your land and you annoyed your neighbor. Um, that's called nuisance. You can be sued for it. You can be held sometimes criminally responsible for it. Uh, barking dog. My dog is barking and bothering the neighbor. That's a nuisance to the neighbor. Now dog barking was a traditional example except now we've got ordinances that regulate that. We've got a city ordinance that says if you've got a barking dog, they can, dog pound can take your dog away and stuff like that. But, it, but it, it's a valid concept. Noise is a better one. A noisy party. You have noisy parties on Saturday night. Lots of loud music. Bothers your neighbors. That's a nuisance. They can call the police to say try to make them stop it. But if you file suit against your neighbor, the cause of action is called nuisance. So nuisance is doing something on your land that annoys your neighbor. Going a step beyond that, the next step is trespassing. And we all know what that is. And that's when you, the book calls it wrongful invasion of somebody's property. Well, hell, it's setting foot on somebody else's property. That's trespassing. We all know what it is. But as a, as a legal, legal term and it's a legal action. And you can sue somebody for trespassing on your property. You own the property? Somebody trespasses on your property. They have interfered with your use of your property and they can be liable for trespass. Now this is not just calling the police saying he's trespassing. You can sue somebody for trespassing. But this is not just, in our context, this is not some guy walked across my yard. This is, you built your building so close to the lot line, it blocks my sunlight. Um, it blocks my ability to see the ocean. I can't see the ocean anymore. Um, you have trespassed on my rights. If anything you did at all, set foot on my property. If you just did it on your property, it's a nuisance. If you do it on my property, it's trespassing. Okay. And lastly is this concept that we touched on a moment ago, of premises liability. And I'm really not sure why this is here but we got to talk about it. If you own a piece of property, you can be liable to people who visit your property and get hurt. Even if they're trespassing. As a landowner, you are responsible to use your property in a reasonable manner so that visitors, invited or uninvited, aren't injured there. Uh, this is really a concept from the area of the law called torts. You don't need to know that. T-O-R-T-S. Torts are all the things that you can do to get sued for. Touching somebody. Um, personal injury lawyers do this stuff. These are the... Uh, <clears throat> Somebody gets hurt and they come into a personal injury lawyer and they say, I, I slipped and fell on a banana in a shopping center. Great. Let's sue the owner of the shopping center. That's premises liability. Everybody who owns commercial property has insurance against stuff like this. This is what you get your liability insurance for if you own a house or you own a building. That's your liability insurance. What if somebody gets hurt on my premises and sues me for it? Um, 
the law has gone on and on in this area and uh, absurd extensions of uh, hell. There, there, I, we had a case in law school where a guy set up a trap gun for somebody who was burglarizing his property. Inside the door, he set up in a chair, rigged up a shotgun and a string to the door, and whoever opened the door, blah, blah, blah. Well, he was held liable for that to a burglar. It was your property, somebody got hurt on it. This is all the kind of stuff the courts get into. Was it reasonable to you, for you to expect that somebody might come onto your property and might get hurt? Yeah, well, this guy knew somebody was coming. That's why he set it up. That's why they held him liable. Would he be held criminally, though? I'm sorry, sir. Wouldn't that be criminally homicide? Um, I don't know whether it killed him. The case that I read was civil liability for damages. Right. Uh, well, so it would be a different case if he were prosecuted. It, you know, the state's attorney might prosecute you for murder. Yeah. What I'm talking about Thank here you. is premises liability for money. Yeah. If somebody gets hurt on your property and then they sue you for their damages. What um, if an animal might? Like? What if you have like a big dog? I'm sorry? What if you have a big dog and someone trespassing gets hurt by Oh, the dog? you absolutely yeah. can oh, yeah. get sued for your dog bite. No question about it. And there's a whole area of law on that. But you know, there's the every dog gets one bite. Do you know he was dangerous? Did you have a sign? Did you have no trespassing? Did you have a bad dog sign? Every dog gets one bite is a real thing? There has been a, traditionally the law that every dog gets a bite to the extent <laughs> that the owner then is on That's notice that he has a dangerous dog. One bite. Until then, you didn't know. Okay. After you, that's a huge thing in dog bite cases is to prove, yeah, he's bitten seven other people before. Didn't you realize he was going to bite me? You know, but if he, if the guy comes back, but he's just a puppy and he never bit anybody. You know, that's the dog bite law. There he is. You get one. Attractive nuisance is a big area here, and this is a, again, this is a totally different area. This is a whole course in law school called torts, but. But attractive nuisance is a big one. What if you build something on your property that is so attractive that it's going to bring people? You didn't, you didn't intend for them to come. But what if I build a Ferris wheel on my property? Hey, I always wanted a Ferris wheel. Isn't it likely that some kids are going to jump over the fence and get in that thing and get up to the top and fall out and get hurt somehow? Probably. That's an attractive nuisance. Swimming pools are a biggie in the attractive nuisance area. You build a swimming pool, you should have known the neighbor's kid would jump in there and drown. You should have known. That's why we have fence lines. That's why we make you screen pools. And, and we have rules on all this kind of stuff. But um, uh, that's, we have a whole area of law on that. This is not real estate law. But this is, if you own a piece of property, this can happen to you. And this is why you have liability insurance and you look at your homeowner's policies or your condo runner's policies and it's, they're all about the liability section of your policy is to cover you when somebody gets hurt on your property, whether it's a delivery man, a lawn man, um, it happens. Or the kid Mailman. dives head first into an empty pool. Absolutely. And it is, is it, is it, yeah, there, there, there's one on draining your pool. Yeah. You should have told, you should have told everybody the pool is empty because a kid might jump in there at night. Anyway, um, those are three kind of adjuncts to what can you do with your property. Well, these are three things you can't do. You can't hurt somebody, trespassing, and nuisance. Um, now, there's one thing at the end of this chapter that I really like and I want to talk about. And I'd like those of you who have a text with you to take a look at with me because I think this is incredibly well written. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. It is. Well, I didn't write down the page. It's the last page of this chapter. Last page of chapter three. 64. 64, did you say? Yeah. Thank you. And it, those of you with the sixth edition or the eighth edition, I don't know what page it is. Uh, changing landscape. Um, I like a lot of the things that are said here. I commend it to your reading. Um, as I know you know, um, the name of this course is Real Estate Law and Ethics. 
uh, and it's not my job to sit here and preach to you what you can do with your property. But there's some really good thoughts in here. Two of them that I like in particular is one at the end of the first paragraph where the guy says in quotes, in the end our society will be defined not only by what we create, but by what we refuse to destroy. This is all about paid paradise. Are we going to take out all the trees so we can have more buildings? Uh, this to me is the ethics of land development. And I commend it to your, your thoughts. Um, I don't mind being called a tree hugger even though I represented developers all my life. Um, I was always proud of the fact that my developers were knocking down something old and building something new as opposed to um, wiping out a chunk of the Everglades and, uh, and making land and houses out of it. Um, there's a good concept in the middle of the paragraph on the, on the middle of the right hand side. Uh, in quotes again, they say when a developer comes in and presents a development proposal and somebody says, what is on the land? Most people say nothing. The author says here, no, not nothing. There's soil, there's water, there's plants, there's animals. There is stuff on the land right now. And we need to pay some attention to that. Um, in my mind, not every piece of land is destined for development. Thank God we have national parks and state parks and city parks. But that still doesn't mean that those things that are not yet parks ought to all be paved. Um, so I commend the reading of this to you. I think it's, I think it's excellent. And I think it's, it's well done. And it, it's a topic that we're going to touch on a little bit, I hope, every now and then as we stumble upon it. Um, but that is the ethics aspect of this course. That, um, I hope we'll ring a bell again. And that's it for chapter three as far as I'm concerned. Does anybody else have any comments or questions before we move on? I just had a comment about the um, the whole thing of having like with, with the swimming pool. I, I did a restoration on the house and I was getting my final inspection. I didn't touch the I didn't touch the fence, um, but we, we restored the pool and we couldn't get our final inspection because the, the lock on the pool gate wasn't working. That's when I realized how important that was. Interesting. You know, so. And that was from the city, city inspector? That was from the, yeah, the city inspector. As a part, inspector. But not as a part of pool construction. Right, not as a part of the pool construction. I mean, the, the, we just kind of cleaned up the pool, and we did the, we restored the house. And, but we couldn't get final inspection because the fence, um, the, the lock on the fence wasn't working properly. And then we had to, you had to have self-closing hinges on it so that you know, once you open it, it comes back and it locks. It snaps back, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I know we've all seen it, and those that don't have a lock on them, have theoretically a little kid-proof latch of some type. Right. It's up, high, it's up up. high yeah. and stuff like that, and that's all, uh, that's, that's all that same concept. Yeah. Um, you have a responsibility to people that you didn't even invite to come onto your property. Those that you do invite, hell yes, you have a responsibility. But even to those that you didn't invite to come onto the property, and uh, and that's that's what liability insurance is for. And we're going to talk in our last chapter about liability of different types of entities, corporate liability, partnership liability. This is very much the type of liability we're talking about. If that happens, you wish your property was owned by a corporation. If it's you, then it's you. Uh, that's one of the huge reasons that people use entities with limited liability is premises liability. There, there are other reasons, lots of other tax reasons or lots of other uh, uh, other reasons. Uh, but a biggie is there, you can't ever decide what's enough insurance. Everybody says, well, if I get a million dollars, is that okay? I don't know. You know, what if, um, what if, Liberace's fingers get caught in your pool filter. It's going to be a lot more than a million dollars. You don't know what's enough. You don't know yet. You just got to decide, well, when do I quit? You know, how much do I need to protect myself against? Uh, so we do the same thing with car insurance or anything else. At what point is my liability covered? And you never know for sure. Uh, Okey-doke, anything else? 
why should somebody be responsible for an intruder, so to speak? Uh, like I remember a case uh, quite a few years ago where a burglar, I think he tried to hide like somewhere in the, the garage and the garage came down on him or, or something like it collapsed on him and he sued the homeowner. Like how does that, like why should I be responsible for my, an intruder who gets hurt in my home? Well, that would be my argument as a homeowner. But the argument of the PI lawyer driving the Ferrari with the gold chain and the Rolex watch suing on behalf of the poor injured little burglar is my God, you know, he was on your property and he got hurt. What else do we need to know? End of story. You should have had, you should have known that a burglar would come into your garage. <laughs> or, or could it be twisted to where it's like, all right, this could have been someone you actually did invite into your home and this whole thing collapsed oh, on them. To me, that's, that's, Is that that's, the that's argument? easy. That's easy. Okay. You, you owe a duty for sure to the people you invite onto your property to keep them safe. But can they make the comparison? Like, if this intruder was somebody that you invited, it could have came down on them. So you should have been, they should have been taken care of already. Yeah, and then and the arguments are, well, is it re should I have known that? Is it reasonable for me to know? Did I know termites had eaten the beams out of this garage so it would come down, or mm. did I not? Or did I build it last month? Let's sue the contractor. No. It's his fault. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ways a lot of games. I think that'd be the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? It's always got to be about the contract. I think it's, it's it always ends. It's always ends. It always starts and ends with a contract. Even, even 50 years later. Yeah. You can find him, it's his fault. <laughs> what happens with those situations where you don't insist on things like that is that you, you can create an unsafe, an unsafe environment. For example, you'll have, like, let's say you have a vacant piece of land. You don't trim the trees, you don't fence it in. Kids go over there and play, there's a sinkhole they didn't know they fall in. Had you been maintaining the property and putting up fences, you'd have secured the public. So you could do some amount of social good, I guess. But I have, have a gate, aspect of that I have a gate that did, says don't come in. Did you know, <laughs> did you know the kids were playing on your property? The answer to that's gonna be, I didn't know. Of course if I had known, I'd have trimmed the trees. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, then, and then you try to prove you knew. And this is, this is all the games that the trial lawyers play to, you know, there's, there are two sides to every coin we always talk about, and uh, um, they, these guys can dream up arguments for either side of any issue, of any injury you can ever imagine. Here's why it's my fault, or here's why it wasn't my fault. Yes, sir? Um, yeah, I remember reading about a case where um, the intruder fell through a uh, skylight, and uh, they tried to sue the, because the guy came after them, they tried to sue the home builder. On, the guy was on the roof and fell through the skylight? Yeah. A burglar? Yeah. And got injured, then he tried to sue the, the family that owned the home. And then they tried to sue the home builder because of the skylight. Defective skylights? Yeah. I don't know. Are skylights supposed to support somebody? It's not built to take somebody's <laughs> weight on it. The contract it's just, just a way. It's, it's, like it's the same thing with the contract. They're just trying to go after whoever they can and not you know, be liable. Everybody's trying to go after somebody else. Exactly. Yeah, these, are great, these are great concepts. And these are, are again, uh, these are... Uh, these are what trial lawyers do, is making up stuff like that on both sides. <laughs> and, um, and why you should or shouldn't have responsibility. And our position as landowners, all we can do is do our best to keep it safe and keep paying that insurance premium. Because if you don't have liability insurance, most importantly, we'll maybe address insurance later. One of the biggest things about liability insurance is not just that they're gonna pay the judgment, they're gonna pay your lawyer. That can be the worst part. How would you like to have to spend 50 grand to defend yourself, even if you win? And if you do win that case as a homeowner, you're paying your own lawyer. Um, so at a minimum, you lose, even if you win, unless you have insurance. And it's the duty of the insurance company to provide counsel for you. So at least, at least you can maybe, 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 you're still going to have years of heartburn and hassle. But maybe financially you can come out at zero if you have a church. If you don't, it's all on you. Mm -hmm. Would no trespassing signs reduce liability? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. No trespassing signs, does that reduce for liability? It helps. Oh, sure it does. That's evidence. But again, if 
If you had a Ferris wheel sitting there and a no trespassing sign on it, what do you think? That's not going to count. Yeah. It might so, I mean, it, it, all, it, it all plays in. You know, Florida, Florida has a concept, not all states do, called comparative negligence. Yeah. In many states, it's all or nothing. Either if you're negligent, you're liable for damages 100%, all the damages, mm -hmm. or you're not negligent and it's zero. Florida doesn't do that. Florida has comparative negligence, which means percentage of negligence. In your case, maybe I should only be 75% liable for your damages because at least I put up a no trespassing sign. And maybe your trespasser are at least 25% liable. But then, you know, trespasser is going to say, well, I, I can't read. Or I'm a kid. I don't know what that says. You know, so there, there's going to be angles on all this, but at least Florida courts follow the progressive majority in allocating negligence based on how much was it your fault? How much was it the fault of the person who was injured? And how much is the fault of the other guy that we're trying to collect from? Um, you know, Florida used to be very progressive, uh, like California, on the cutting edge of all the new stuff. Um, this is kind of a political comment, I hate to say that, but now that we've kind of gone the other direction with our legislature and it's conservative, Republican, we're not progressive. We're just the other way. We're the last to follow suit. Um, and, um, but Florida was very much on the cutting edge when it, edge when it adopted uh, comparative negligence. And it, it helps in our situation of, am I going to be 100% liable for all this? Or 0%? Or maybe somewhere in between. And that, you know, if a guy has $100,000 worth of damages, well, maybe it was 25% his fault he shouldn't have been on my Ferris wheel, you know. Um, so at least we can mitigate it a little bit. This is, uh, we ought to quit here though, because the lesson in real estate is you can be liable for what happens on your property. And the second lesson is you better have insurance. Okay, go. Uh, next chapter. Chapter 4. is called the states and land. And there's an awful lot of stuff at the beginning of the chapter that I'm going to tell you is irrelevant. And we're not going to talk about it, and you're not responsible for it. This book is big on history, how we got there. How did the law get to be what it is today? And I think that's all real interesting if you've got three years in law school to learn it. No, 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 not even that interesting there. But, um, <laughs> but certainly not in the time we have a lot. At best, we're going to cover the list of status of the law today. So this chapter wants to go into feudalism and how the king owned the land and you just lived there and you had to give him some of your crops. And mm. Today, Today, we have absolute ownership of land. We got a name for it. It's what you think ownership means. It's what we all think ownership means. I absolutely own the land. It's called fee simple. It's also called fee simple absolute. And it's sometimes called just fee. And it's sometimes didn't call any of those things. Sometimes just called you own it. And it is the absolute ownership of land in the fashion that we all know it. And what it means is, except for regulation by government or by some of these other principles we talked about earlier, like nuisance and stuff, you get to do everything possible with this piece of land that you own. Fee simple gives you the whole bundle of rights, the whole bundle of, of sticks, the ability to sell it, to mortgage it, to lease it, to build something on it, to destroy it if you want, to dig holes in it. It's your land. You do whatever you want to with it. That's our concept of ownership of land in, in America. And uh, it's not the way it is around the whole world, but that's how it is here. And that's called fee. Everybody 
we'll often hear, who's the fee owner? It's the owner. Owner as we all think ownership. Um, but as we talked about earlier, ownership of land is really the rights that go with the ownership of land. And this is the same thing we're talking about. The rights, you have all of the rights, you have the right to do with it as you see fit, including, and this is going to become an important distinction, including the right to devise it. That means to will it, to bequeath it, to decide what happens to it upon your death, whether by will, by trust, by gift. But if you own the fee, you can of course sell it in your lifetime, but you can determine what happens to it upon your death too. That's all part of fee simple absolute. Now, the text goes on to talk about something called a defeasible fee. And all that means is you have a fee simple, but somebody can take it away from you upon the violation of a certain condition. Uh, the text calls it, it terminates upon the happening of some future stated event, which really means there was a condition in the deed when you got it and you violated it, and the title goes back to who you bought from. It talks about two kinds of them. I'm going to tell you what they are, but you're not responsible to learn those two names uh, because the importance is the concept. And then an example of a concept is I'm going to deed my piece of land to you so long as you never put a filling station there. If you ever put a filling station there, title's coming back to me. Pretty sure you're not going to put a filling station there then because you're not going to want to pay me for it and, and it coming back. Um, this is separate from something we're going to talk about in the future, which is restricting the use of land. And also government restricts the use of land and you can privately restrict the, restrict the use of land. But this is a step way beyond that. This is saying, if you violate the way I'm restricting it, it's coming back to me. And that's a big. Doesn't happen very often. There are two kinds of them. There's a fee symbol determinable, and that means if you violate the condition, it automatically comes back to me. And then there's the other one they talk about fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. You don't need to know these terms. That means it may come back to me. Maybe if you violate the condition, it'll come back to me. And maybe it won't. In that case, I'd have, I'd have to do something to take it back from me that I'd be entitled to. So is it automatic or does it come back if I do something to take it back from you? In either case, because you violated a condition. Um, I want to give you a good example of this. I think a good example. Um, it's kind of a stretch, but it, um, it affects all of us. Um, it's Birch State Park. Um, heard me refer to that before. I, I kind of grew up in the area of Birch State Park, loved it as a kid, hung out there. Uh, Birch State Park was donated to the state of Florida by Hugh Taylor Birch. That's why it's named Hugh Taylor Birch State Park. Um, actually, it, and it was in his estate and it went to, I think it was Hanover College or Dartmouth, one or the other. But under his instructions, they uh, the land was given to the state of Florida saying, state of Florida, it's yours so long as you use it as a park and so long as you keep the land in its natural state. Um, and that sounds simple enough. Leave it alone. Natural state. Birch State Park was full of big beautiful Australian pine trees that used to grow along State Road 84, you know, big Australian pines. Uh, somebody got the idea that Australian pines are an invasive species. They are not native to Florida. And, oh my God, if we have Australian pines in Birch State Park, the land might not be in its natural state. And it might revert back to Hanover College 
and we might lose the whole park. And the state of Florida, under, I guess, legal advice from somebody, that, oh my God, you got the wrong kind of trees in here and they're not native, came in and took all of the Australian pine trees out of our state park. It was a beautiful green, 60, 70, 80 foot place of green, evergreen trees and needles and pine cones and not cool. They took them all out. All of a sudden we had palmetto scrub brushes about this big and a few sea grapes maybe this big and gorgeous Bird State Park, you know, which is an incredibly valuable piece of property. I mean, you've got a half a mile on the ocean, you've got a mile on the intercoastal and everything in between. You can imagine if all of a sudden that was owned by some private individual who wanted to start selling it for condos and apartments and stuff. So Florida, under the pretext of, gee, maybe it's not natural, title might revert back to the Birch Estate. We better get all the trees out of here. But the concept was the same thing we're talking about. What about violating a condition in a conveyance that automatically allows it to revert back to the grantor, we call him. The guy who deeds something as the grantor, title could revert back to the grantor uh, based on the violation of the condition of keep the land in its natural state. Easy to have other simple examples, but I mean, this is a local one that really, really hit home for me. Um, are you about to raise your hand? No, okay, no, I thought that was coming and you were, you were sitting on. Um, okay, that's the concept of a defeasible fee. That's a fee simple that is defeasible, which means. Actually, I do have a question. Coming back. Yes, yes, ma'am. When you said, what I was thinking about was when you said natural state. Was he referring to natural state as to when he was alive or were those trees put in after? That's a good question. Because uh -huh. I'm saying what would make them what would make them say we have to take out the trees? Because it could have been the natural state that he had grown up seeing it in or that he was used to seeing it in and he wanted it kept that way. Australian pine are natives of Australia and are considered to be an invasive species. That was the theory. Whether they were there when Mr. Birch was around or not, I don't know. The justification for removing them all was, geez, we could lose this piece of property because this is not its natural state. We should therefore only have native vegetation and palmetto scrub and sea grapes are all they left. That was it. Um, and mangroves. Um, okay, now, life estate is the next thing we're going to talk about. Now, life estate is like a fee simple that you get to occupy the property. And you can do all these other things we talked about, but there's a limit. And here's the limit. When you own a life estate and a piece of property, you only own it until the day you die, period. That's it. Upon your death, you don't get to will it to anybody because your rights are over. You only had the right to live on the property and use it within restriction. You, you can use it certain ways and we'll talk about that. But the point is that your estate is good only for the rest of your natural life. And if you transfer that to somebody else, well, it ain't their natural life. You know, it wouldn't do any good for me to give it to some 20-year-old and say, ah, now he can have a lot longer than me, I'm going to die. No, it's measured by my life if I have a life estate. Now, here's why they're important. Uh, they're a big estate planning tool used in Florida. Um, there are a couple ways they're created. There are a bunch of benefits to them. And the way that they often come into play, one of the ways they come into play, is parents retaining a life estate in the piece of property, the right to live there for their life, passing the fee simple on to their children immediately upon their death. When you have a piece of property that has a life estate, somebody owns the right to what happens upon your death. Mm -hmm. That person's called the remainder man. Okay. So, in a life estate situation, 
you've got the life tenant, is the term we use for them, the life tenant. It's almost like a tenancy, but you don't pay rent. And then upon your death, it's going to pass.